carnival hands. You won the giveaway from last week. Comic fam, enjoy your trending comics list. Another week, another list of the trending books in the comic book marketplace. Another villain introduced into the Marvel Cinematic Universe at the table with Russ Bright and Overstreet Price Guide Advisor. How you feeling? Tom, I am fantastic, and that Loki finale was insane. You were looking all swag today because of it, but Kang and all of the implications for the next phase of the MCU, incredible. I am so excited, but right now we are going to talk about... uh amazing 1980s book. Hit that like, slap that subscribe button, stay tuned to the end. We got another giveaway on deck and let's chat about G.I. Joe. Coming at the list at number 10, $280 average sales, a $2,000 CGC 9.8, and that barcode is hitting $2,500. We're talking about the newsstand in high grade. I think the animation success over this last year proves one thing. Not only 80s nostalgia is real, But that cartoons are the way to go with certain franchises. I'm talking He-Man, Kevin Smith getting involved, revitalizing the hit property. We also have Invincible on the minds of so many collectors with a handful of new fans as well. And now G.I. Joe just made that list. We're seeing a 121% increase on the news this week that there's not only a series coming, but we already know that there are two seasons going to be coming for the animated G.I. Joe series. Now, this is an incredible book. It's a great story. And the fact that writer and Vietnam veteran Larry Hama was intentionally trying to make a Nick Fury series before he was approached by Hasro to promote their three and three quarters toy line that's when this really started going. The fact that G.I. Joe, a real American hero, started with issue number one, but for the last 40 years has been produced by Marvel and Image and Dreamwave and all of these other incredible companies who keep carrying the torch. If you're a fan of G.I. Joe, there's always a new story to read. The Snake Eyes movie, I'm all hyped for that, is coming soon. And now that we know that we have an animated series on its way with two seasons attached, go Joe. Number nine on the list, we have Thor number 245. This is the first appearance of He Who Remains. We are seeing $70 average sales and $579 for a CGC 9.6. The last reported sale we have for a 9.8 was back last year, and that was only $200. We're seeing this movement, obviously, because of the Loki show. A 233% increase in copies sold after a storm of eBay purchases. Basically, a lie hitting the internet because we had a reveal that no one really expected to happen. They were all hoping we were going to see Kang. We were all hoping we would see Jonathan Majors take on the role prior to the slated role that's going to happen in Ant-Man Quantumania. But would they do it? And they did. And the ramifications are huge. Now, He Who Remains, who Jonathan Majors goes by in Loki, is actually a completely different character in the comic book, but his tasks and his goals are identical. He Who Remains is the final director of the Time Variance Authority, sitting at the end of time, the last reality of the multiverse, chilling in his citadel. So what Marvel did is essentially combine multiple characters from the comic book to be able to showcase a version of Kang without giving the full reveal that many thought would be just reserved for the movie. Now, we also have these major ramifications as mentioned. What does this mean? Well, it could be summarized by Boss Logic, one of the best artists of our generation. He tweeted this breakdown, and I felt like this was the best way to put it. So Boss Logic posted on social media this week, and his explanation goes this way. Basically, anything can be canon. There are infinite versions of all characters. Recasting does not need any type of explanations. And we have a multiverse war that is coming. Maybe Secret Wars. This comic being featured on the list this week really means something important because this is a different character than who Jonathan Majors portrayed, and we're not going to see a rendition like this. It's very unlikely in the future. This is another one of those books that we have collectors, new collectors, hunting for because the show hit them hard. It matters to them. This is a show that's memorable, and they want to have a memento that reminds them of where they were when they saw Loki. And now at the list at number eight, we're chatting some Jim Starlin goodness. Number eight on the list, this is the type of book that we make sound bites about. No one was specking on Infinity War, number one, $10 average sales and $100 high sale for a CGC 9.8 because we saw the reintroduction of Doppelganger in Extreme Carnage Scream this week. Well, this book is the first appearance 
of the Marvel doppelgangers. Now, the Spider-Man doppelganger is the one that we're chatting about today because he was featured in Scream. This is the character that post this comic book really became popularized because of the animated series and comic books because he chills with Carnage a lot and they kick it all the time. But you know what? This is one of those fan favorites. I grew up in the 90s watching the animated series. So this is one of those villains that is so memorable because he's so creepy and scary looking. So this issue specifically introduces a lot of Marvel doppelgangers. There's more than one. So this is kind of a double key with multiple spec reasons behind it. 340% increase in copies sold this week. And this book kicks off with an amazing classic Thanos scarecrow. I love this first page. And then we go right into the doppelgangers. We get to see an Iron Man doppelganger. There's a Wolverine doppelganger. There's a Mr. Fantastic doppelganger fighting with Mr. Fantastic. This is such a classic book. Magus, who is essentially the counterpart to Adam Warlock, causes a ruckus by unleashing all of these doppelgangers. There's not just these three either. They have a plethora of Marvel characters that get their counterparts introduced in this comic book. And considering that now we have the Spider-Man doppelganger on the minds of collectors, plus a reveal this very week that the multiverse, as Boss Logic eloquently put, is open to any versions of characters, a $10 buy-in, looks more appealing by the day. Side note, Kang also appears in this comic book. Anytime Kang shows up, I'm just going to get hyped now. <laughs> All right, next on the list at number seven, we have what? More Kang to talk about, Avengers 269. $20 average sale, $200 for a CGC 9.8. This is the Battle of Kang versus Immortus, and we see the origin of Kang as Rama Tut. 600% increase in copies sold this week. You need to be keeping up with Key Collector Comics. This is where we get all of our information from, sourcing and keeping track of all of this rapidly moving information. This show dropped and caused so many spikes in the collectible market, and this is just a sign of what's to come. There is going to be so many random issues that are going to pop up and become valuable that you can hunt in those bins. I encourage the community to support the show and unlock a free two-week subscription by using code TOM101. Now, we have a mortis to chat about. Now, this is really interesting because we get to see Kang fighting Immortus here, but if you were paying attention to the Loki show, we've kind of turned Kang into this trifecta. You have Kang who has identified himself as he who remains as well as part of Immortus. So you've kind of got this amalgam of all three characters. Now, identifying himself as he who remains was a very interesting take, but the reason why we're looking at this as an Immortus personification is because Immortus is the master of time, literally pruning the variants and the chronical branches to preserve the timeline when things are looked at as being dangerous for the reality that he's protecting. And this is essentially what Jonathan Major's character was doing at the Citadel at the end of time. Immortus even refers to himself as the gardener of time and uses very flowery words. He's talking about reducing reality to a bloodless meadow. The fact that he wants things to be a forest. He wants it to be a jungle. And that we know that there is a season two coming. There's going to be more, but it won't be exactly Immortus. It's going to be Kang doing more immortus -y stuff. You can thank Sylvie for that. Next on the list at number six, dude, Fire Guy Ryan's about to get a new name for himself. I'm thinking we need to call him the Comic Whisperer. Number six on the list, Chariot number one, $20 average sales. And again, Fire Guy Ryan knew it first. Ryan's this dude brought Chariot number one to the table to chat about it on the podcast over a month ago because it seemed really interesting. This dude doesn't spec and he doesn't really collect expensive comics, but he's also called like five different series from a plethora of available comic books in the month that they were released that have spiked to all hell. We're talking $20 average sales. Dude, over 60 plus copies sold since the announcement. We just found out this week that this has been optioned by Warner Brothers and we already have a writer and a director attached. It is great to know that we have someone on the team who just smells these books. He happens to know when things are going to spike. He just has great taste. Reading comics is a big part of the speculation game and having someone who is all about the text, all about the story plays a big role. So well done, Fire Guy Ryan. I encourage the community to check out the podcast where we actually talk about this issue number one. We give it a breakdown. A Cold War era muscle car that becomes 
essential to fight crime because of a petty criminal trying to save his dying son. It feels a little bit like Knight Rider meets The Wraith. I mean, I'm all in on this book. I wish I had known about it and picked up a copy for myself when it came out. Number five on the list, we got Astonishing Ant-Man issue number 12, where Daring Cross becomes Yellow Jacket, seeing $20 average sales and an increase of copies sold of 567% this week. Evangelina Lilly on Twitter mentioned that we may see Mr. Cross reprise his role post Ant-Man back in May, and that was just confirmed on a podcast this this past week, courtesy of Vanity Fair, that fight scene between Yellow Jacket and Ant-Man is one of my all-time favorites in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. Absolutely agree. I mean, just the fact that they're bouncing around and you hear the cure. I mean, it's really one of those that it's a perfect moment. I actually kind of like stopped breathing when I was in the movie theater. It was so perfect. One of those fight scenes I find myself re-watching a lot because I enjoyed it so much. Now, this right here is now adding another layer of spec to a comic book because we saw in Loki Episode 5 a giant size head of yellow jacket's helmet we thought that maybe that was just an easter egg but maybe yellow jacket is going to go up against giant man at some point well we know that happened in a timeline but our timeline not a lot of people were buying this book we have just shy of eighteen thousand copies ordered by retailers and for a marvel book that is fairly low Let's keep the conversation going with some giant-sized superheroes. At the list at number four, we have Incredible Hulk 258. But we're not talking about Bruce Banner. We're not talking the Hulk. Bear with me, comic fam. We'll get to it. We have the first appearance of the Soviet Super Soldiers, Dark Star, Crimson, Dynamo, Vanguard, and Ursa Major. $50 average sales, $500 for a CGC 9.8, and it is a 1,180% increase in copies sold this week. This is the first team appearance of the Soviet super soldiers, and we know that this week, the Dutch giant actually tweeted out that there's confirmation that his character in the Black Widow movie is absolutely Ursa Major, which does make him the earliest actual mutant in the MCU. This is great news, guys. We saw the Dutch giant in Black Widow in a fantastic arm wrestling scene with Red Guardian, and he even gets called a bear in the scene. But he doesn't <laughs> go full bear. This is a character who actually turns into a mammoth-sized bear. And this dude is freaking huge. I found this picture of him on an airplane. Damn. Can you imagine sitting next to this guy? No, Tom. If I was going to my seat and saw this dude in my row, I would ask to go sit somewhere else. I imagine not a whole lot of elbow room sitting next to that gentleman. This guy is huge. And he did go on Instagram and posted how proud he was to be able to take on this superhero and that he was indeed Ursa Major and that he hopes to be able to go full bear in the future. You know, he did a strong man emoji as well as a bear emoji. He does confirm that he is the first mutant introduced into the MCU. Although Scarlet Witch is technically a mutant, the only ties to the mutant lineage is the fact that she mentioned that she was born with her powers. It wasn't a strict connection. Next, on the list at number three, we're chatting more Kang. Goodness, Avengers 267 seeing $40 average sales and a high sale of a CGC 9.8 of $175. And that was back in May. This book is going to break $300 easy when it comes up. 450% increase in copies sold this week. This book is the first appearance of the Council of Kangs. We also see first appearance of tons of unknown Kangs and Kang robots, as well as the first appearance and the death of a Kang variant that the Avengers killed. Kang, 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 more Kang, so much Kang, lots of Kang, shaking sticks at Kang. It's amazing, and we're probably going to see more of these Kang in the very near future. Prior to Sylvie's decision to end the sacred timeline, to fracture it and create a multiverse of madness, was Kang's warning that when he falls, there would be more coming, that he would be reincarnated, that there would be an attempt to conquer time via other variants of himself. The Council of Kangs themselves are convening to be able to make sure that they can fix what happened when Kang made the Divergent timeline. This is crazy. 450% increase in copies sold on this book this week. Next on the list, a book making it on here because it's so damn good. One of my favorite ongoing maxi series. We have James Tynan IV killing it with The Nice House on the Lake. Issue number one, hitting $18 average sales. I have a strong feeling that this book is primed just like all of his other damn titles 
to be optioned. And when it does, this book is one that you are going to wish you kept. Now, some of you may not have heard the term maxi series before, but a lot of times when you have a small arc, you're going to get a mini series, three, four, or five. A maxi series is 12 issues. Sometimes it's nine, 10, 11. You have something that's a little bit longer, like Watchmen or the new Rorschach that's coming out from DC. And you know that you're going to be able to get a book every single month over the course of a year or round about a year. And it will probably cover two graphic novel volumes or one thicker volume. It's just really something that we don't see that often. DC happens to do it a little bit more than Marvel. But really, it just means that you're going to get more story and that James Tynan has too much story to tell for only five issues. Now, spoilers incoming, but this book came out over a month ago and is largely sold out. So if you haven't read it, I want to get you into it. So issue number one, first off, largely takes place in a beautifully drawn home on the lake. The environment is stunning. The home itself makes you feel like you would actually want a vacation there. So much time was put into every visual aspect on the page that you really are excited for these characters to have a good time. But unfortunately, you are shocked when you find out that the world beyond the lake has come to a fiery end. Issue two came out and reveals even more jaw-dropping things. This home has not just a beautiful setup for our characters, there's even a comic book room with Sandman for them to read. 107% increase in copies sold, which doesn't sound like a lot until you realize that's over 300 copies. This book has been selling consistently, and yeah, it is a beautiful home. This is the type of thing that you would see on Airbnb for like $1,000 a night. ComicTom101.com to support what we do. We've been doing this video for three years straight every single week without missing a beat. And we have two stellar variants. I'm so excited. I've been holding out on these images to showcase to the community for quite some time. The first is one per box. The second may not be. We're still going through damages, but both artists are the same. Davey Go bring in the absolute heat. And the first comic that we're dropping, one per box, is a golden age homage to one of the most popular good girl covers from the golden age. We have Matt Baker getting done right by the great Davy Go. We have an homage to Phantom Lady 17. Betty Page number three from Dynamite Comics. The fact that we were able to get a Matt Baker Phantom Lady homage done by Davy Go, it's incredible. I'm so shocked that we were even able to do this and it is stunning. But what's more stunning even is that we got an Ice Cream Man variant, and it has been causing ruckuses. Good word choice, Russ, because that's indeed what's happened. Some images of this book has made it out there, so some members may know that it's coming, but we do indeed have our first Maxwell Prince Ice Cream Man variant that won't be one per box at this point. We're still dealing with damages. You know if you don't get that second variant that there's going to be something else dope in there. And as of July, we started including a guaranteed second exclusive, a children's book homage that is one per box. So no worries. You're going to be stacked up really well for the whole family. And at the list at number one, let's talk about the number one trending book in the world because I don't think it's going anywhere anytime soon. Number one on the list, Inhumans number five from the 1999 run, the first appearance of Yelena Belova. We are seeing $120 average sales on this book, and we've been talking about it for years. And finally, now that Black Widow has been released and people have seen Yelena Belova in action, this book is back on the list with a vengeance. CGC 9.8's hitting $800 and climbing this week. We've known for a while, based off of Natasha Romanoff's future in the MCU, because this movie dates back prior in the timeline than what happens in Endgame. Spoiler, she's going to die. There's going to be a new Black Widow that's going to take her place. And considering the reveal at the end of the movie, no spoilers yet because a lot of members haven't seen the movie just yet, this character has a future in the MCU, and this first appearance is only going to keep climbing. We have our next Black Widow, and we have a CGC label that only puts that this appearance is in the shadows, that you don't actually see her 
full face reveal. I mean, when you look at these panels, I think it's going to be pretty certain that this is indeed her first appearance. When you see in the shadows, you think about like Mystique's first appearance. She's only one panel. This is she's in five, six, seven panels, and we get to see part of her face multiple times. This is her first appearance. 239% increase in copies sold this week, and it is a strong increase. Florence Pugh absolutely killed it in this role. What'd you think? I really didn't know her before this, and I loved her in this movie. I was actually shocked at how good this was and how much I liked this movie. Taskmaster is being largely ridiculed and compared to the Deadpool appearance in Wolverine Origins. So that's a disappointment, but Yelena Belova outshined the rest. She held her own, and she's going to slay it in this role, and I'm excited for her to take on the role of Black Widow and join as the superhero in the Avengers. She's going to bring the heat and so much so that I thought it fitting that we mentioned a handful of other comics for the community to spec on and consider because some are very affordable. If you guys remember Wizard Magazine, they always included previews and cards and extra things, and normally we threw them away, but the Marvel Knights Wave 2 sketchbook, that actually came out, and it had a full sketch of Yelena Belova and her first cover appearance. Now, it's only a partial and considered a cameo, but it goes for under $15. Take a look at this. Black Widow, Pale Little Spider, issue number one, is considered her first solo ongoing series, and that's hitting under $10 right now. So this first solo series was released in 2002, written by Greg Rucka, and the covers by Greg Land, really, really an underrated series. And then we have from 1999, the Black Widow issue number one variant with a wraparound cover featuring Yelena Belova on the front and Black Widow Natasha Romanoff on the back. And this comic is definitely creeping up in price because it is her first cover appearance. But I think all of these books are low. We were looking at prices and surprised how long it took for them to go up. And I think it's because of the lengthy delay of the movie. I agree. Comic fam, did you see Black Widow? What do you think about all of this Kang stuff? Like, subscribe, comment down below for a chance to win this copy, which was on the list. I picked that up this week at a comic shop just because I thought it was a cool Kang appearance, not knowing it was going to make the list this week. Even Jonathan Majors is picking up Kang appearances. Look at this picture over at Golden Apple Comics in LA, grabbing an Avengers 267 that made number three on our list. We got to hear your thoughts in the comment section. Like and subscribe. And as always, keep responsibly. Glorious purpose. Enough said. We got other videos for the comic fam. We know you got a podcast right here. And we got the Hot 10 right there with Gem Mint from Gem Mint Collectibles talking about those monster record breakers. You don't want to miss it. Have a great week.